Hello there, everybody. Welcome back. Today, we are going to watch The Aham Kingdom, How Thai Migrants Built a Northeast Indian Superpower by Odd Compass. The reason we are watching this is because I have just made a Assam map on Geotastic. Uh, Geotastic is a geo-guessing game, uh, and I plan on going through every single Indian state. Uh, and in the comments of the Assam map, I was uh, recommended to go ahead and watch this. It would be... Uh, relevant, I suppose, to uh, the most recent video that I made. also want to say that in that video, I, I looked up the pronunciation of Aham, or Assam. Now, the pronunciation of the people from there, they do call it Aham, but I guess most of India calls it Assam, and, you know, in English, it's also Assam, so uh, I, I, I'm going to go ahead and just go with Assam. Um, even though Aham, I guess Aham and Assam are very different. I mean, yeah, I mean, if you look at this video, maybe we'll learn. Maybe we'll learn the difference. How about, how about we just, we just watch the video now, okay? The history of India's Northeast is cloaked in mystery. Fueled by stories of dark magic and tribal warriors, it sometimes feels exotic and out of reach. But Dark magic and tribal warriors? Okay. Not today. In true Odd Compass fashion, we are going to shine a light on a history that has remained in the shadows for far too long. Meet the region's greatest power, the Aham Kingdom, one of the most fascinating in Indian history. Theirs is a remarkable tale of migration, dynastic ambition, and courage in the face of extraordinary danger. For despite many challenges, the Aham dominated Northeast India for nearly 600 years, humiliated the Mughal Empire, and left a lasting legacy that survives to this very day. 600 years is a long time. So the Mughal Empire is the empire that took over most of the um, Indian subcontinent, right? I'm pretty pretty positive that's the one. I haven't really dived into the history of that quite yet. This is their story. Today's narrative begins in the medieval era, but not in India. Not yet. Let's turn our attention further east to the wealthy frontier region of Yunnan, the original homeland of the ethnic Thai group that would later become the Aham. Uh, Yunnan? Really? That's like up where uh, parts of Laos and China are now. Interesting. Okay. Yunnan was in the perfect location for commerce. Yunnan province is a Chinese province. Okay. So yeah, that makes sense. Okay. Anyways. Commerce at the crossroads of several overland trade routes connecting India, Tibet, Southeast Asia, and China. And so by the 13th century, the Aham parent kingdom in Yunnan, better known as Muang Mao, had prospered. Muang it helped Mao. that the Aham had close ethno-linguistic ties to other groups scattered throughout the region, in both Thailand and Burma. But everything was about to change fast. The 13th century was a turbulent period across much of Asia, so too in Muang Mao. The relentless aggression of the Mongol Empire disrupted trade routes and destabilized. Just how big was the Mongol Empire? Just, it, <laughs> it's, it's wild just to think about it. Because you hear, like, you, over here, you hear, you hear stories of it. And you're like, oh, you know, 2% of the world's population is related to Genghis Khan. Um, but, like, <laughs> is that the same Mongols? Mon I mean, yeah, it's the Mongol Empire. I mean, it's not, obviously, not the same person, right? But, um, <laughs> it's, it's crazy. Anyways. Lies the political landscape. Meet the crown prince of Muang Mao, Sukhapa. In the midst of all this 13th Sukhapa. century chaos, the crown prince was suddenly passed over for the throne. See, King Pung had no male heirs, and so he nominated Sukhapa, his nephew, as his heir. But just a few years before the king died, he finally had a son of his own. The keys to the kingdom were handed over to Sukhapa's young cousin, thus removing... It's always, it's always an issue, isn't it? <laughs> Moving him from the it's, it's always a, it, it, uh, there's, there's just so much conflict is, is fought over who gets to be king and ah uh, the line of succession whatever. the details of this event are unclear and speculation runs rampant hmm. though he disagreed with the decision Sukapa did not actually challenge his cousin's ascension to the throne that's good perhaps it was his grandmother's counsel that studied him for Sukapa's grandmother is believed to have said just as no two tigers can live in the same jungle no two kings can sit on the same throne. And so, Sukapa accepted that if he were to make something of himself, it would have to be in a new country, a place where he could rebuild his destiny. Filled with a renewed sense of purpose, Sukapa sought to plant the seed of a new kingdom, a fresh start. Rumors traveled fast among the caravan merchants funneling into Muang Mao. 
Sukhapa learned that a once prominent empire, Kamarupa, had lost its grip over the Brahmaputra Valley in northeast India. Sukhapa could not afford to miss out on this opportunity. The Brahmaputra Valley was not only fertile and naturally protected by mountains, but it was also, like Muang Mao, connected to a vibrant trade network. But Sukhapa needed settlers who understood his vision. A keen diplomat, he secured the allegiance of five Aham lords. These lords brought with them warriors, priests, merchants, and, of course, peasants to labor and work the land. In total, the migrants numbered more than 9,000. Together, they had the resources to support a long and uncertain journey. In 1215 CE, they set off for India. Over the next 13 years, the Aham marched through Burma and towards Northeast India. It took 13 years? I, I was going to say, I mean, <laughs> if you just look at how mountainous and hilly the region is, it is, it is wild. I, <laughs> it, it, I'm surprised there's even like a trade network through there to begin with. Um, also, what was the name of this region again? I'm, I'm sure they'll say it again uh, in the video. Using diplomacy to secure safe passage through foreign territory, but sometimes they encountered opposition to their presence. In 1227 CE, for example, they brutally subjugated the tribesmen at Nanyang Lake. Whether through military victory or diplomacy. Sub subjugated? Okay. The Aham established a series of subordinate states in their wake, known as Mongs. Sukapa would assign some of his loyal followers to stay behind and lead while fulfilling specific strategic goals. For example, the Hmong established at Nanyang Lake was for guarding the route back to Yunnan. In any case, the Aham kept moving forward. So it was after 13 long years that the Aham finally crossed the Patkai Mountains and entered the Brahmaputra Valley. Brahmaputra Valley, okay. Located in what is today the Indian state of Assam the kingdom was officially born. Assam. Yeah. Sukhapa must have been relieved, for the Brahmaputra Valley was just as they had envisioned. Just one problem. It was home to powerful tribal polities, some of whom saw the migrant Aham as a potential threat. I mean, if you think about it, it, it they were not, it wasn't just a potential threat, it was a threat. They came to take over the region. <laughs> There's nothing potential about that. <laughs> <laughs> Remember those piping hot rumors about the collapse of Kamarupa power in Northeast India? Turns out the rumors were true. That, my friends, is the sound of a newly formed power vacuum. Competition was fierce among the Brahmaputra Valley tribes, many of whom had previously served as Kamarupa feudatories. Sukhapa and his advisors took decisive action yet again. They staked their claims in between the Damasa Kachari and Shutia tribal kingdoms, in a marshy area of the valley. They also sought to establish good relations with various tribal groups, especially the Barahi and the Maran. Sukhapa further strengthened these bonds by marrying the daughters of the Barahi and Maran chiefs and encouraging population intermixing. Thanks to these successful diplomatic relations, they gained a foothold in the region. Over the next three decades, Sukhapa and his followers moved from place to place within the valley, converting forests and marshes into thriving wet rice cultivation sites. They established several Hmong colonies until finally settling a capital in 1253 CE. The boundaries of the kingdom were starting to take shape. Interesting. So Sukhapa, it took him 40 years, 40 plus years to even just start to like take over the area, right? Or like completely take over the area, maybe even longer because he was 13 years of travel and then this 30 years of progress through, uh, you know, transforming the land and, you know, talking with everybody. But while Talking. the land was less populated, many local Naga tribes were averse to the idea of a foreign power occupying their lands. I would imagine most people would be adverse to that. Conflict. <laughs> it's common, though. That's just, I mean, we're all humans, right? And it, uh, foreign or not, we're all humans, but still. Between the Aham and hostile Naga was inevitable. The Aham Naga conflicts, both large scale wars and tribal rebellions, continued for more than two centuries. Isn't Nagaland also a name of a state there in India? It's just right to the, the southeast of uh, uh, Assam, right? It was a constant back and forth. The Naga had the advantage of greater numbers and better knowledge of the terrain, while the Aham had the advantage of superior military technology and tactics. Sukhapa's alliances in the region proved especially useful during these early conflicts, as it gave his people access to critical support and resources. But according to some accounts, it was the use of war elephants that gave the Aham a decisive advantage. The Aham. I wonder how 
crucial elephants were in the history of of, of uh, humankind and especially especially around you know this region and around the Mediterranean region the African region because um, I mean you know, you go back and you you, you read about you know um, the elephants being used for war and combat but you know you I don't ever really hear many people talk about it interesting Palm were skilled in capturing and training elephants and they <laughs> that's actually kind of cool <laughs> <laughs> Battle armored elephants. Oh my goodness. Okay. Use them to devastating effect. Naga tribesmen were not prepared to counter the large scale use of elephants in battle. Over time, the Aham outmaneuvered and overcame the resistance of the Naga tribes. The Aham could finally shift their focus towards expanding their nascent state. When the Aham arrived in Northeast India, they were just a small group in a hostile foreign land. To strengthen and consolidate their position, they employed an assimilative process called Ahamization. Ahamization involved the gradual absorption of local groups into Aham society through political alliances, intermarriage, and sociocultural exchange. Over time, various ethnic and tribal groups were successfully integrated, the Barahi, the Maran, and even many Naga tribes. Ahamization worked because to become an Aham conferred many advantages. Conquered nobles were given high-ranking positions, and local kinship groups were accorded the same level of power and respect as Aham noble houses. So this is the good way to do it, I guess, <laughs> if there's a good way to take over an area. Um, <laughs> you, you, you give the people the respect they deserve, um, you don't brutally slaughter all of them. Looking at like uh, Western expansionists, um, even my own country, <laughs> um, uh, you try to integrate them as much as possible. That's that's the appropriate way. If it, there isn't even is it appropriate? There's God, it's it's such a complicated thing because here I'm you know calling a a conqueror, uh, saying oh I'm praising him for doing it in a less. Uh, less brutal fashion, but it still, you know, comes down to the fact that he's a conqueror. I, I don't know. Anyways. The Aham also introduced new technologies that significantly improved quality of life, such as the technique of wet rice cultivation. This agricultural technique was so transformative in Northeast India that the Aham Literary Chronicles considered it a gift of the gods. But history as a way of changing things. The 16th century saw the Aham expand along the Brahmaputra River, conquering the Shutya kingdom in 1523 CE, among other territories. This brought millions of Sanskritized Hindus under Aham rule. The Aham oh. were now so greatly outnumbered in their own kingdom that the one-way imposition of Southeast Asian norms, Ahamization, was no longer feasible. No. Instead, a reverse process began. The Aham were finally becoming Indianized. Consider the imp interesting. Okay. Impact on Aham religion and language. When they arrived in the subcontinent, the Aham were largely animist, following a religion known as Pralung. They pra Pralung. I never heard of it. Practiced ancestor worship and venerated objects that were believed to house spirits. And though the Aham did integrate tantric Buddhist elements into Pralung, the core of their beliefs remained Thai. But the demographic shift in the 16th century shook things up. Soon enough, it was Hinduism, not Pralung, that would come to dominate the religious landscape of the kingdom. And during the reign of King Susungpa in the early 17th century, Hinduism was made the official state religion. That being said, elements of Pralung did survive the adoption of Hinduism and were adapted. Hmm. It was during Susungpa's reign also that the Aham language was gradually replaced by Assamese as the language of the court, and Sanskritized Hindu Assamese, okay. The names were given to the nobility in addition to their Thai names. King Susungpa, for example, was better known as Pratap Singha. I, I, this whole this whole concept is so funny. It's like they went, they conquered the area, they took it over, they implemented all their things, their religion, uh, their ethnicity, and then they conquered the neighboring area, and then it just got a full reversal on them, and then they became they became more Hindu than in than their Thai roots. That's interesting. That that's the really administration interesting, of the Aham Kingdom is best characterized by the establishment of uniquely Southeast Asian institutions. These institutions mirrored the background of the Aham, who maintained much of their original Thai culture. Consider the Paik or Kel system of labor. The Paik system imposed a compulsory labor obligation on all able-bodied men between the ages of 15 and 50, with exceptions. Sounds like communism. Exceptions made for nobles, priests, and artists. Mm, 
Eh, <laughs> uh, kinda. Each man was a pig, and four pigs formed a god. Each would be rotated through various work groups across the kingdom, and each work rotation would last. It sounds like a more ethical version of communism, minus you know the rulers don't have to you know do it as well, which is around three months per year. While a pig was on rotation, the other three members of their god would tend to their lands in their absence. In exchange for their service, pigs were allowed a piece of land to cultivate. That's Though it cool. had many flaws, the pig system provided the state with a cheap and reliable source of labor, and it maintained social cohesion as it created bonds between the diverse peoples ruled by Okay, so they gave them land in order in in the price of actually getting getting the land was to work under this system. Okay, okay. By the Ahang. Naturally, the system also gave rise to a flurry of construction. The Aham built many fortified cities and palaces, temples, and monasteries, the greatest of which were grand structures made of brick and stone, boasting elaborate carvings and decorations. The Aham also built many reservoirs to irrigate fallow land. This significantly boosted agricultural productivity, and they built a network of roads and bridges to connect their population centers, facilitating migration and trade and commerce. Innovations were also made in the political realm, the Aham implemented a form of leadership known as the Patra system. Under this system, each of the five great officers of the state were selected from one of the power. Okay, <laughs> the Patra system. We have Borborua Porfuk. I, I'm not even going to attempt to pronounce it. I'll let him pronounce it. I'm sure he does. Powerful noble houses. These officers had different functions. Some served as regional governors, and others served in a military capacity but they were all advisors to the king. Hmm. Later, these officers were organized into a council of ministers for the king, called the Patra Mantris, and one of the officers would be designated the Rajmantri, or prime minister, with additional responsibilities okay. and powers. The Patra system- This is a very, uh, very reminiscent of a, like a modern day style of govern governing. That's interesting. Some was an important aspect of Aham governance. Aside from the king, obviously. Its purpose was to prevent any one official or faction from accumulating too much influence and to ensure that power was distributed fairly among the various noble houses. Thus, by the dawn of the 17th century, more than 350 years after their arrival in India, the wow. Aham had developed their kingdom into a regional powerhouse. Ironically, the growing wealth and geopolitical importance of the Aham painted a target on their back for the Mughal Empire, already pushing into South India now saw opportunity in the northeastern corridor. But the Aham weren't about to go down without a fight. With the Mughal takeover of Bengal in the late 16th century, the Aham were keenly aware of the risks posed by this new imperial power in their neighborhood. And so they took a proactive approach to defense. They built fortifications, trained up soldiers, and stockpiled weapons and munitions. And on their western front, they supported Kosh Hajo, hoping that it would serve as a buffer state against further Mughal expansion. Hmm. This buffer didn't last long. In 1614, the Mughals easily took Kochaja. Tensions ran high for the Mughal Empire now directly bordered the Aham Kingdom. It was obvious that the Aham were next in line for conquest. The Mughals searched for any excuse to attack, and so they sent merchants to illegally harvest agar wood in Aham territory in the hopes that it would provoke a response. Spoiler alert, it did. The Aham responded by capturing and executing several of the unauthorized merchants. This oh God, okay. police action provided the pretext for war. In 1616 CE, the Mughal Empire used Bengali subordinates to invade the Aham. But if you recall, the Aham were well prepared. They pulled back to a better defensive position, holding their ground at the fortress city of Samratha. There at Samrada, the Aham absolutely trounced the invading Mughal forces. Word of Aham victory spread across the subcontinent. But the victory was incomplete. Over the next few decades, there was a relentless back and forth. Each wow. side used both indirect and direct methods to secure an advantage, from trade restrictions to violent raids and prisoner exchanges. Fast forward to 1662, when Emperor Aurangzeb appointed Mir Jumla II, Viceroy of Bengal. Aurangzeb entrusted him with the task of finally conquering the Aham Kingdom. Mir Jumla gathered a sizable naval fleet, which included Portuguese, Dutch, and English sailors, and pushed up the river Brahmaputra. Oh, I was like, the naval fleet, and then I forgot, yeah, the river's massive. Okay. First targeting the region of Kamrup. Initially, you don't think 
you <laughs> you don't think a, a war taking place in the middle of the Himalayas, Himalaya, Him, Him, Himalaya. I, 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 there, I always add an S to it, but there's no there's no actual S at the end of that, right? It's just Himalaya. A war in the Himalaya. Well, I guess Himalayas would be appropriate. I I don't know how do you, how do you, I don't know how the correct pronunciation um, would <laughs> would have a naval conflict. I don't know for some reason you just don't I I just don't think that like when I think naval I think you know um, seas oceans lakes but yeah giant river that works too. The Aham offered almost no organized resistance. Hmm. It was an unexpectedly oh. weak defense. And so the Mughals took garrison after garrison, fortress after fortress. Emboldened by his victories, Mir Jumla swept into the Aham capital, Gargan, forcing the Aham king to flee into the hills. The takeover greatly enriched the Mughal invaders with equipment and loot, but trouble was brewing for the Mughals. See, the monsoon season was fast approaching, and soon the Brahmaputra River would be unnavigable due to torrential rain. Mir Jumla suddenly found himself in a highly vulnerable position. He was now isolated from his relief forces downriver in Dhaka. What followed was a six month thrashing. The Aham disrupted Mughal supply lines and launched endless hit and run attacks on enemy defensive positions. Then an epidemic broke out in the Mughal camps. Taking advantage of this opportunity, the Aham reclaimed significant territory. Still, the Mughal forces survived the monsoon season. Though battered, they remained in control of Gargaon and a few key areas and by September, they were invigorated by fresh armies sent upriver from Dhaka. Worried that the fighting would continue, Jadwaj Singha sued for peace. He was given back his- Sued for peace? Sued. Capital, but agreed to a substantial war indemnity and even sent two of his daughters to join the Mughal harem. It was a fragile and humiliating compromise. Enter King Chakradwaj- I couldn't, I got uh, that. Singha okay. and his brilliant advisor and general, Lechit Borpakan. Chakradwaj had a fiery spirit. Peace would not last for long, as he refused to pay any of the remaining war indemnity to the Mughals. According to Aham records, he shouted from his throne, death is preferable to a life of subordination. Before the Mughals could adequately prepare, Aham forces took back the Kamrup region and more, reclaiming territories all the way up to the old Mughal border. Aurangzeb was furious. He sent a Rajput commander, Ram Singh, to handle the situation in the Northeast. For four years, conflict ensued with peace talks interspersed, but the Mughals and their Rajput servants refused to offer a reasonable compromise. Hmm. The cartoonishly arrogant Ram Singh underestimated his Aham opponents and thought that he could secure an all out victory for his Mughal masters. And so he launched an attack while in the midst of peace negotiations. Thus began the Battle of Saraigat in 1671 CE. The Mughal forces under Ram Singh had superior numbers and superior technology, but there was a It's like a flip on <laughs> a flip on the or, or the origin of Aham. <laughs> problem. While they fielded massive warships, the ships were not actually designed for river combat, nor were their soldiers trained for it. By contrast, the Aham forces under Lachit Borpakan had an intimate knowledge of the Brahmaputra River. As such, they fielded smaller, more maneuverable war boats that could navigate the river currents with ease. These boats enabled Aham forces to move swiftly and strike the Mughal fleet from unexpected angles. And though Lechet was severely ill, he led from the front and pushed every possible advantage to win the battle. He employed unconventional tactics, even going so far as to release trained crocodiles into the river, creating pit. <laughs> trained crocodiles? Okay. First we had war elephants, now we have trained crocodiles. Panic and confusion among the Mughal ranks. The Aham also used fire arrows to set enemy ships ablaze, splitting the attention of the Mughal officers and giving Aham soldiers an opportunity to attack freely. Caught off guard by the Aham's relentless attacks, they were thoroughly defeated at Saraiga. In the years that followed, there were many more skirmishes between the Aham and Mughals, but none as significant as the fascinating Battle of Itakuli in 1682 where the Aham used deception and psychological warfare to secure victory. See, the Aham built several mock forts along the Mughal's path to Itta. Oh. These forts, built with cheap materials like bamboo and mud, were designed to appear like formidable defensive structures. The Mughals wasted valuable time and resources trying to capture these forts. And while doing so, they were constantly ambushed by Aham forces, 
who were using hit-and-run tactics to inflict heavy casualties. The Mughals decided to withdraw, and the Aham emerged victorious once again. But this time, long-term peace was secured. The Mughal Empire would no longer pose a threat in the Northeast. With the Northeast huh, now okay. stabilized, that's the Aham kingdom... That, that's actually really cool. They were able to, to push back the Mughals there. ...expanded rapidly, fully annexing its neighbors, the Damasa Kachari and Jaintia kingdoms. In fact, in the era after the Mughal conflicts, the Aham went through something of a golden age, reaching their zenith in terms of territorial expansion and economic prosperity. But by the mid-18th century, a reform-oriented Hindu sect had spread like wildfire among the peasantry of the Aham kingdom, promising them equal rights and opportunities. Attempts to suppress this new sect failed. Tensions soon erupted into a devastating civil war, the Moamoria Rebellion. The damage should not be underestimated. By the end of the century, the Aham population reduced by a staggering 50%. Other powers sought to take advantage. The Burmese... Wow. Whoa, okay. The intervened in the early 19th century, and this was followed by a final takeover of the Aham Kingdom by the British. So it was... So the, 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 it fell because they had a civil war. Oh, man. In 1826 CE, that the Aham Kingdom breathed its last. And now you know. The history... Uh, so yeah, <laughs> um, wow. Okay. That's, that's really interesting. I didn't know any of this. This is, this is not something that I've ever learned in any history class. It's not something that I've, 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 you know, read or seen any documentaries on or any papers on. So this is, this was entirely new to me. The Aham kingdom. That's actually really fascinating. I kind of dig it. I, I, I would really like a more in-depth, uh, explanation, uh, documentary. I need to look for something of um, like all the conflicts that they had because it seems really, really interesting. Okay. Well, there it is. The Aham Kingdom is now Assam uh, <laughs> after, uh, you know, centuries later. What was the original name of the region? Let me, let me go back here. Here, here it was. Over the Brahmaputra Valley. In North Brahmaputra Valley. What was it? Sukapa learned that a once prominent empire, Kamarupa, Kamarupa was the empire before Aham. Okay. All right. Well, yeah, there we go. That was Odd Compass. Shout out to them. Amazing channel. Absolutely amazing channel. I, I really, really dig what he's doing here. I'm going to actually just go and take a look at, at some of the stuff he's got going on. Greeks, Romans, and Indians. Let me, let me, let me open this up. Okay. Yeah, it looks like I <laughs> uh, I need to, to watch some of his other stuff here as well. Interesting. Oh, with that being said, everybody, I hope you all have a good one, and I will catch you later, okay? Remember to do the normal YouTube stuff, like, comment, subscribe. And if you like geoguessing, uh, that's kind of the main focus of the channel. I do geoguesser, and right now, for the past few months, I've been heavily focused on India geoguessing. So, geoguesser and geotastic. But yeah, with that being said, hope you all have a good one. Take care. Goodbye.